we went on our trip, me and Milos and Fernando. Fernando, just stand up for a second so people know who you are. Yeah, he went with us. He took time off of work to go with us to Louisiana and helped us quite a bit with driving and everything else. Um, it, was a, it was a good trip, I think. Uh, we gave away uh, everything that we have collected, a lot of personal stuff, you know, hygiene, tooth, toothbrushes and paste and soaps, shampoos and all kinds of things. And the pastor that we worked with, the Baptist pastor, told us that you know, he says, by now, everybody has forgotten about us. So we're real grateful that you guys are here. And uh, so that was, that, that was um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, yesterday, the same place got hit again with another hurricane. Same location. It doesn't happen in, in uh, maybe, uh, that, that never happens, you know. Maybe in 100 years that the same place would get hit twice. And they got hit twice in two months, in less than two months. So... Uh, I texted him yesterday, the pastor over there, and he says, we are staying put because we want to be able to help the community after this is over. So I got a feeling that we will be helping them again and sending them a little more help. Thank you all for your participation and donations and so on. It means a lot to people who don't have a roof over their head anymore. We went into these neighborhoods and... Uh, he's going to show pictures next week, but you have uh, trailer parks, and the, this, this Baptist pastor says, see, people live over there. And I say, nobody can live over there. The windows are blown out. There is a, a piece of tarp over the roof because the roof is gone, you know. And he says, no, they're living in there. See, the car is parked in front of the house, and sure enough, there are people living in there. Uh, no, no AC, no nothing, you know, no power, no nothing just a tarp over their, over their house because they don't have the money to go live in a motel or somewhere else. Um, this is the condition of humanity everywhere around the world. Uh, in one neighborhood, you have these wonderful million and a half dollar homes that are all getting fixed up because they have the insurance, they have the money. And then the mile and a half down the road, you have a trailer park that's just gone, you know. And those people are suffering. So this is the world we are living in. In that same context, I want to talk a little bit about priorities today. And uh, f in my mind, priorities are real easy. Uh, if you know what you're all about, if you know who you are, if you know what it is that you want to do in life. I was watching recently, uh, last couple of days, I was watching... Um, the documentary about Michael Jordan, and uh, I forget the name of it, but it was, it's on, uh, it's on uh, YouTube, and uh, the guy was all about the basketball. That's it. That's it. Nothing else in life interested him. He wasn't, you know, I mean, he loved other things, uh, golf, playing golf, and making money, and all of that stuff, but, but his primary purpose in life was basketball. If he, if he wasn't playing it, he was practicing it. If he was not playing against some team, he was in the gym working out. And he said, you know, everything that I have accomplished in life, I'm paraphrasing, he said, everything I have accomplished in life is because of what happens on that court. I score a lot of points and then everything else happens, you know, money and fame and everything else. But, but that's what he was about. And sometimes you run into people who have a clear purpose in life and clear priorities in life. I've, uh, I've known a professor. <clears throat> he was walking around with a shirt that had ketchup and mayo on it, and he didn't know it. And his shoes were never clean. They never, you know, they were always muddy. And his pants were always, you know, I mean, he looked like, like he was homeless. And he always had a notebook in his hands, and he was always pouring through, through these... Uh, formulas and, and, and theories and, you know, totally absent-minded, dysfunctional in every sense of the word, but he was top, uh, at the top of his profession because his priority was his craft, his specialty. That's all he lived for, you know. So if you know what you're about, then priorities are easy. If you know that this is who you are, but the problem is most people don't. And most people, therefore, have all kinds of, 
of side activities that they are involved in. And you do all kinds of stuff that has nothing to do with nothing, and you're doing 50,000 things in your life in any given day, and you, then you wonder, well, why am I not succeeding? Why am I still here at this, you know, in this position in life? I should be... Well, your priorities are all over the map, you see. Luke 12, 34 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So, the question then, obvious question from that is, where is your heart at? What's, and and to, to answer that question, you have to determine um, what is your heart obsessed with? If you want to know where your treasure is, you got to figure out, and you can figure out that very quickly, what's your obsessions? What are you obsessed with in this life? With? What are you obsessed with? Are you obsessed with a relationship? Are you obsessed with money? Are you obsessed with uh, fame? Are you obsessed with getting to a particular thing in your life, you know, to a particular point? Are you obsessed with the newest and the, and the fastest uh, Dodge Charger car that's coming on the market and you're going to buy it? What are you obsessed with? You see, wh where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And your treasure is the thing that you obsess about that you are all about, that consumes your time, that consumes your energy, that consumes your wallet. That's how you figure out what your treasure is. So once you know that, then you know where your heart is at. And everybody in this room right now, myself included, we can pretty quickly figure out, you know, what's our treasure and what's our heart all about. Stephen Covey, who was famous for time management theories and whatnot, said most of us spend too much time on what is urgent and not enough time on what is important. And when you look at that statement, it's true. Most people spend their time and their priorities on the things that just pop up, you know, they're urgent. Uh, we came back from Louisiana and I, we drove, I mean, <clears throat> before I went home, I said, let's go by the church because I wanted to do something. So we came by the church and the things that just popped in my sight was we have a green patch of grass in front of the church and we have a yellow patch of grass over here. And next thing I'm doing is I'm calling on the phone, Ted, my buddy, who is a good uh, plumber and takes care of our sprinkler system. I'm saying, Ted, what's going on here? You know, so all of a sudden something that, w that is really not that important has become urgent to me because I know that, uh, that our well, you know, we are, not, we are on a well water. That's going to be shut off in October, on October 15th, which is in a few days. And I'm calling Ted. I'm saying, hey, can we soak this grass before they shut it off completely because some, something's going on. This, is the, this grass is dead, you see. So here we have a church that has... Five or six or seven groups, I don't even know. All kinds of different issues that are going on. You know, whether the, I mean, you name it. Baptisms and visitations and all of that stuff. And the only thing that's on my mind that day is the grass, you see. And why is it yellow? And why, what's going on with it, you see. So it's a perfect example of how <clears throat> urgent takes over uh, what is important. You know, there are other things that are much more important. But we all have the same problem in our lives, you see. We, uh, we focus sometimes, a lot of times, on things that are not, should not be a priority. Jesus is clear when he says, and we're going to be in Matthew 6, when he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So he does not mince words. He does not complicate things. He makes it very simple. And when you look at this verse, it looks very simple on the surface. But what does it really mean? What does it really mean? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Gandhi said, action expresses priorities. So, so when, you, when you are thinking about it, 
And if you want to figure out what somebody is all about, all you have to do is look at their actions. If you're, if you're still not sure what you are all about, what's in your heart, what your treasure is, just think about your actions. What are your actions? What do you focus on? What do you spend most time on? Where is your energy? Where is your effort? You see, if, I don't care what people say. You know, I learned this a long, long time ago. A lot of people say a lot of different things. People say, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to, you know. I always use the same example in my sermons, you know. So if you heard, you're going you're gonna to hear this again. I had a guy who says, Pastor, if I win a lottery, I'm going to spend the money to build a new church, you know. And I'm like, uh, what are you doing for a church right now, you know. I don't want to wait until you. But, so people say a lot of things. But what is it that they do? People say, I want to lose weight. And they, they never exercise. People say, I want to save money. And they blow everything on credit cards and just whatever, you know. People say a lot of things, but what is the action that you do? People say, I love Jesus. Well, how do you show it? Are you helping others? Are you doing something for the community? What do you involve in? You see, so we are sitting here now... And what I'm trying to do is trying to get everybody to think about where am I at? What actions am I taking? What's in my heart? You know, what is my treasure? Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God first. Now, he said this in the context of the worries and troubles and problems that we all have in this life. That was the context. Because in verse 25, he said, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Wow, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. I thought, I thought it's important to take care of myself. I thought it's important to put money aside. I thought it's important to protect my life. You see, to what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? These are material things. World we live in this world, you see, where we need to have these things in order to be okay. You see, and Jesus says, I tell you, do not be anxious about those things. Well, I tell you, everybody is anxious nowadays. I, I mean, if you're not anxious, then you're not following what's going on in the world. You see, everybody is worried. Disney just fired a bunch of people. Companies all over the United States, all over the world, are firing people. I'm anxious. We got two pastors here in this church, you know, and two and a half because our Indonesian pastor is on half a salary. And our tithe this year is $40,000 down in a hole. And you look across the board, you know, when I get the report from the conference and I look at all of the churches, and that's just the case with just about the majority of the churches. People are staying home, not coming to church. Majority of our people are not coming to church since March. You see, people can't send the money in because they're not working. So, am I going to have a job at the end of the year? Is Miller going to have a job at the end of the year? Jesus says, do not be anxious. But, you know, you got to be anxious. You got to deal with reality of life. <laughs> you see, you got to deal with reality of life. You don't know if you're going to have a job next year in January. If you're a nurse, you probably will. If you're a doctor, you probably will. But if you're a pilot, you may not. If you work in a restaurant business, you may not have a job next year. Because a lot of restaurants are closing down. And a lot of restaurants are, you know, firing people. So we become anxious about things in life. You see, and Jesus says... Do not be anxious about these material things. And then he says in verse, six, in verse 25, Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? I don't know, is it? You, you got to think about this, right? I mean, we just said the dedication for these two kids. Their mom and dad, they have to work. They have to put those kids into good clothes. They have to provide heat in the winter. They have to provide, you know, medical services. God forbid something happens, you know. So we need these things. And Jesus says, is not life more than food 
in the body more than clothing. And then you start thinking about it. And you realize, yeah, life is more than food. Life is more than clothing. Life is more than material things. Life is about family. Life is about neighbors. Life is about each other. Number one regret that people have is that they did not spend the time with their loved ones. Number one regret. When the time comes and you realize this is your last day on this planet, number one regret is I did not spend time with those I loved. I did everything else. I had all kinds of urgent priorities, but I didn't focus on what was right. And Jesus says, li uh, implies life is more than that. Look at the birds of the air, he says. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and, the, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you, not more value, are you not of more value than they? Look at the last sentence in this verse. That's the trick. That's the key. That's the secret. That's what separates those who worry and those who don't worry. Whether or not you realize how valuable you really are to God. If you, don't, if you don't realize that, if you don't think that, if you don't buy into that, you're going to be out there anxious and worried. Trying to protect your life on this earth. If you don't realize how valuable you are to God, you're going to be out there trying to do all of this stuff on your own. See, I got to do this. I got to do that. I, you know. Are you not of more value than they? And I want to ask you, what do you believe? Do you believe personally, as you sit here and as you listen to these words of Jesus that were spoken 2,000 years ago, do you believe that? Do you believe that you are valuable to God? That's the key. And then Jesus says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? You can wor worry all you want. You're going to lose in this life. You're going to lose. You're not going to win in this life. Everybody loses. This lady that I mentioned, 103. Life is going to, this life on this planet is going to destroy every one of us. Every single one of us. You can worry all you want. You're not going to add an hour to your life. Verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And you look at that verse and you're like, why is he talking about clothing? He's not talking about clothing. He's talking about the things that we do to protect ourselves. I put on a shirt this morning, and we all put on clothes this morning to protect ourselves from the sun. We put the hat on to protect ourselves from the rain. We put the shoes on to protect ourselves from the ground that we walk on. Clothing really is a symbol of how we as human beings try to do all kinds of things to protect ourselves. We build a nice house. You know, if you live in a hurricane uh, area, you build a house strong, you know, with shutters, metal shutters, so when the hurricane comes, you shut down your house, you, you know, you put up those metal shutters, your roof is strong, your building is strong, you know, you button it down, and you hold in, you hold in, stay inside, and you're going to be okay. 
You protect yourself. That's what clothing is. I like driving these big cars because I've been in accidents in little cars and I've been in accidents in big cars and I like big cars. That's my clothing. You know, I protect myself with it. Wrap myself around that big chunk of Ford metal, you know, and I'm not worried. If you're driving a little Hyundai, you're in trouble if you run into me, Kim. <laughs> so, you see what, what he's talking about? You start looking at this, these verses and you start realizing Jesus is talking here a little bit more um, about life and our philosophy of life and how we approach things than he is about the actual clothing and food. He's talking about whether or not you depend on God. Because you cannot protect yourself. Let me repeat this again. I, I hate to say this, and I hate to hear myself say this. And I know you're going to hate this, and you already hated it when I said it the first time. You cannot protect yourself on this planet. Sooner or later, the end comes. Sooner or later, everything that you have gets taken away from you and me. Everything. So, so that's why he says... Don't be anxious about food and clothing and all of these things because in the end, they're not going to protect you. You're going to lose them all. You got to worry about something else, you see. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you or you of little faith? How valuable are you? If you and I trust in God and if he becomes our priority, seek first the kingdom of God. Then when everything is said and done, you are not going to be thrown into the oven. That's what Jesus is talking about. In this world, no matter what we do, we're going to be vulnerable. But when a person seeks God, you see, then God provides eternal salvation for them and overcomes the natural consequences of living on this planet. That's the only way to overcome it. No other way. Therefore, he says, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Do not be anxious. Do not focus on those things. They may be urgent, but they are not important. Those may be urgent things, but they are not important. For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And guess what? Your heavenly father already knows what you need. That's a given. God knows what we need. He knows we need food. He knows we need clothing. He knows we need some sense of security in our lives around us. He already knows that. And then Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God. You see how he progressed he talked about all of these things that we should not trust in and worry about. And then he comes back and says, first, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So the things of this world, the things that we need to survive in this world will be added to us. But seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, don't go... Don't go at this life alone by yourself. Don't go at it alone. Because if you start worrying about all of this other stuff, you're going at it alone. You don't trust God. You don't believe that you're valuable to him. You're focusing on the wrong things. Your priorities are wrong. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. Uh, look at this next one. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, Things which matter, matter m most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. Seeking the kingdom of God 
is the single most important thing that you and I as Christians have to do. That's our priority. That's why we are here. We are not here for any other reason on this planet. When you decided to follow Jesus, what that means, you, you are like a little kid playing hide and seek with God. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And one kid hides, and all the other kids, they go look for him. That's what it means to seek. If somebody hides and you don't seek, then you're not playing the game. You see? The New Testament Greek lexicon defines this, these words, seek first, by seeking in order to find. So we say seek the kingdom of God, you know, and we kind of just gloss over it and read it and, you know, we don't stop to think about it. What does it mean? Well, if you're going to look for something, you are looking for something because you want to find it. <laughs> you know, when the early pioneers came to Colorado and decided to go look up, uh, look for silver in the mountains, you know, and gold, I mean, they were expecting to find it. They didn't go just look for something, not knowing what they were looking for. They went looking for a specific thing. And the purpose was to find it. To aim at or strive after something. It also means to look for, go after, and to search for. So that's what it means to search for the kingdom of God. You got to actively search for it. How much time today, yesterday, this week, how much time did we spend seeking God? Whatever, is, whatever you're obsessed with, that's your treasure. That's where your heart is. So you got 24 hours in a day. Let's say you sleep 7 or 8. You work another 8. We're driving 9 or 10. Well, what's left over? 6, 7 hours. Average person spends 6 hours on TV. How much time does an average Christian spend seeking God? Where your treasure is, is where your heart is. What's your treasure? What do you spend your time on? What's the majority of time spent on? Let me say this. You know, it's impossible for us to just drop everything and go live in a monastery and study the Bible. It's impossible. We got to work. We got to live. So this is not necessarily about I'm going to drop everything, you know, and I'm just going to pray and study. I no. I think it's more about the mindset. You got to work. You got to go to work for eight hours. Does that mean you don't see God for eight hours? No. You see God in all situations, right? Maybe you're going to have a conflict. Well, you seek to bring God into that situation. Maybe you're going to have an opportunity to help. Maybe you're going to have an opportunity to be offended or to offend somebody. Maybe you're going to have an opportunity to do something good. Or maybe you're going to have an opportunity to do something bad and really feel righteous about it. Whatever the situation may be. You see? So you got eight hours there at work. What are you doing? You're bringing God into that. It's a mindset. It's a mindset of getting up in the morning and saying, Lord, I want to do whatever it takes to, um, to be on the right side of, of, of what you want. To please you. To do the right thing. That's a mindset. That's what it means to see God. You're constantly looking for a way, for an opportunity. Exodus 20, verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. So that means, you know, maybe I'm working, maybe I'm making money, maybe I'm being successful. Great, fantastic. It shouldn't be a God for you. God should be number one. And this should be, you see, in the service of God. Whatever we do, whether I'm a pastor, you know, and I'm worried about the yellow grass, or whether you are driving a truck, or whether you are a super successful businessman, whatever we do should be in the service of God. Maybe you're a nurse. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Maybe you have your own business. Doesn't matter. Is it in the service of God, or is it in the service of you? So you shall have no other gods before me. A famous philosopher, Bruce Lee, said, it, it, it is, 
Okay, you finally people are catching on. Bruce Lee died a long, long time ago, so a lot of young people, I don't know if they even know who he was. It's not the daily increase, but the daily decrease. Hack away at the inessentials. What is it that's taking away your focus from God? You see, a lot of little things can come up in life. And maybe you don't know what you're all about, and that's why you're doing a million different things, you know, dabbling in this and that, and your priorities are all over the map, and you're constantly, you know, trying to figure it out. You know what? This, <laughs> one of the main principles of priorities, you can go on YouTube and just punch in priorities, TED Talk or whatever, you know, and everybody's going to give you the same advice. Get rid of all of the non-essentials. Get rid of all of the things that are taking you away from what it is that you are all about, you see. If you're all about music, then you got to pour your soul into that, like Michael Jordan poured his into basketball, and Muhammad Ali into boxing, and Bill Gates into software, you know. And those things became the most important to them, and Apostle Paul into Jesus, and Apostle Peter into Jesus. You see, they, I mean, everything else, narrow tunnel vision, focusing on what is most, that's the principle of priorities, you see. In Christianity, that's how we need to think about God. Move to the side everything that's preventing us and that's taking away from our focus on God. And you got to identify what those things are. And then hack away at them like Bruce Lee says. You can chop away at them too. So how do you seek God? And obviously there are some obvious answers that, that have been um, told millions of times. Prayer is one of them. Prayer is one of them. Not just any prayer. Not just, oh Lord, bless this food and not just, oh, Lord, help us to get to Louisiana and back safely. Those are, those are prayers. They are prayers. But the real prayer is when you open your heart to God, when you really, really tell God what's bugging you, when you don't mince words, when you really share what's in here you know when you really have that tough conversation with God a lot of people have these fluffy prayers you know world is not simple world is hurtful and painful and we ask why and it's okay to go to God and say why why this you know and it's okay to Pour out what's deep in your heart and in your emotion and in your gut. That's a real prayer. That's how you get to seek the kingdom of God. That's how you get to seek God himself. When was the last time you had one of those deep, honest, emotional, raw prayers? You know, nature, as we were down in Louisiana, they took us to this place uh, north of Lake Charles, just beautiful. I mean, the nature is just beautiful. They're growing rice over there. And when, then when the rice season is over, they flood all of those fields, and then they grow some kind of a fish in there. And the birds were singing, and this was a nice, beautiful, warm day. Nature. You go out there, and you are immediately, if you, if you allow it, you're immediately connected to the Creator. To the one who invented all of this beauty. 
to the artist who painted all of those colors. You see, we don't do it. We go on, on YouTube, you know. We don't do it. We are, everybody's stuck in their uh, iPhone. You go out there to see God. Prayer, nature, Bible is another one. Like we did today. We opened the Word of God. We read the verses, right? We didn't even go into it very deep. Just superficially. But yet, it speaks to us. The Word of God. And when you study the Bible, you know, today, you can be a researcher. When I started seminary, if, you, if I wanted to research a topic, I have to go to a library... I have to get a reference from a professor, a reference sheet of all of the different authors that wrote something about it. And then I have to go pull out 13 different books. And then I had to find the page that I want, you know. Now you just Google it. When I was putting this together, I Googled it. Anybody can research the Bible. As a matter of fact, when this is all over and when you get a little free time, when you're at home and when you have time to study your Bible, go to Google and, and put in, uh, uh, and put in uh, the title of uh, the priorities in the Bible. Just put that in. Principles of priorities in the Bible. You're going to get unlimited number of articles and videos and TED Talks and whatnot. Anybody can research the Bible. Put in them, what does it mean to seek God first? Punch it into the Google. I'm going to give you better answers than I will because you're going to find all kinds of theologians out there talking about it. So anybody can be a researcher. We don't have an excuse anymore uh, not to research the Bible. And then when you study it and you understand it, then you ask the final, the most important question is, okay, what's this to me? How does this apply to me? I hope that today, as we are studying this, you know, you can say, how does this apply to me? Am I seeking God really as, as a priority in life, or am I just coming to church as, a, as one of those events that I do once a week? Very important questions. I tell you the last thing, the last thing that I think allows us to find God more than anything else, more than anything else, and this is my opinion, you know, is when you go and you do something that we just did, and Debbie will show you just a couple of pictures, you see, this is Lake Charles neighborhood where we went. And this place is just totally destroyed, totally gone. On the next picture, we went and we talked to this uh, gentleman, um, he's not in the picture here, but uh, we, are, we talked to this guy, and he's, he's sitting on his porch, tarp over his roof, and uh, the, the big guy is a Baptist pastor that was our host, and we started talking to this guy who owns this house, and he says, there's nothing I can do. I'm sitting here, and I'm waiting now for FEMA for six weeks, and they keep telling us they'll do this, and they'll do that, and we're still waiting, you know. There is nothing that brings you closer to God, nothing in this world, than when you go and you do the work of God. This, you can show that little video, Debbie. This is how they are just picking. Uh, now imagine this was Wednesday, and then yesterday they, another hurricane came through this same area. But imagine what, what happened to all of the piles of that trash. 100 mile an hour winds came through again. You see? So this is what's going on in the world. And I believe that th there is a picture there, Debbie, that I want you to show. The, the one before that. The one before that. There. I took this picture because it was a pile of somebody's house there and there was a bicycle there. You can see how it's mangled up and thrown away. 
And I thought this picture is appropriate in, what, in the context of what was said here today. Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God first. Don't worry about clothing. This is, to me, this is an example of our lives, totality of our lives on this planet. That's the end of every one of our lives. That's the end. It all gets taken away. You see, maybe you leave some to your kids. Sooner or later, a generation or two later, all gets taken away. And then somebody has to start from scratch again. There is no winning on this planet. The only way to win is to seek the kingdom of God first. That's the only way to win. Because God then has something totally different and better in place for us. So I believe that when you realize all of these things and when you start giving of yourself to others, when you start helping others, when you start ministering to others, I believe that's how you find the kingdom of God the fastest. Now you can show that, uh, that uh, slide, Debbie, uh, that you were anxious to show because it's so good. You can give without loving, but you can never love without giving. I saw this somewhere, and, and I decided to bring it into this message because I think it encapsulates the ministry and the service to God. I can give a lot without loving. I can do that all day long. I go to the store, and I buy something, and they say, would you like to donate a dollar to... Children's Hospital. Yeah, sure, why not? Maybe I'm embarrassed to say no. I mean, but I give a dollar. Or they say, would you like to round this up to, you know, $13 instead of $12.35? Yeah, and I'm going to give. And maybe when the tank offering was here, I looked and I saw $3 in there and I gave because they were in my pocket and you can give without loving. But that's not how you want to give. You see? But you can never love without giving. Now you start getting to that level. Now you are really on the right track to find the kingdom of God. When you start getting to that level. Where you do the things that you do because you love others. When you do the things that you do because you want to see them saved. When you're not focused anymore just on me, but I'm also focused on those people over there. They mean nothing to me. I don't know them. We're not related. But they are living out there in, in these horrible conditions. Indonesia. Africa. Here, the United States. You see? So you start focusing on love. And you start focusing on Jesus. And you start focusing on how much he loves you and how much he values you. And then you're on the right track to finding the kingdom of God. I saw this quote that I want to share with you. I don't know where it came from. I just saw it online and I thought it was good. The next one, Debbie, please. This one. All of your fears brought into the light can no longer harm you, my love. I don't know who said this. But we have anxiety in this world. We have fears of the future. We don't know what's going to happen in January. We don't know what's going to happen six months from now. But when you bring all of your fears to Jesus, He is the light. You see, He is the light. Then this world cannot hurt you anymore. Then this world has no power over you. When Jesus becomes our priority... When Jesus becomes the focus of our lives, then nothing anymore can hurt you. And there is no reason to be anxious anymore. Because he's going to take care of you. Philippians 3, 13 to 14, I want to close with this. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. One thing. One thing. Priority. Forgetting what lies behind. Forget what you did be before. 
forget the past, and straining forward to what lies ahead. Straining. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know what he just said? He said, I'm going to forget all about the past. I don't care what happened in the past. I'm going to live for one thing and one thing only. And that one thing is that I be on that roll call when Jesus comes and he calls me up. That's what I'm living here for on this planet. And, that, and once you internalize this and digest it, you get up in the morning and you say, I'm going to live today in such a way that God is going to have no recourse but to put my name on that list, on that reservation. Reserve my seat, you see. That's how I live my life. So that when Jesus comes and when he calls my name, I'm ready. That's what it means to seek the kingdom of God first. In everything that we do. I hope that this message helped a little bit. And I hope you'll continue to study it. And I hope you come back next week for the conclusion of this series. God bless you. Amen.